you feel that the web evidence against uh, Charlie is overwhelming at this point? Do you think he's taking a chance? So you, you went from just having to understand the back and forth flow of all of the wiretap calls to one condensed 41 minute conversation where he literally says, well, why didn't they know it was me? Welcome to a special edition of Surviving the Survivor. The Dan Markell murder with Carm on crime. And it was a unique day today, Carm, because uh, for the first time ever, we took two separate vehicles. You had physical therapy uh, on your shoulder, which you fractured when my father was in the ICU, which really made life interesting. Not and fractured, dislocated. Dislocated, and it was all black and blue. And I understand that on your drive here, somehow, did you end up going the wrong way on a major road? No, 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 no. I, ca- I got into the intersection and then I couldn't go into the lane because it was backed up and I couldn't back up because it was not no space. So I was sitting there and everybody was cursing. Carm, uh, that's what we call extreme agony for the other drivers on the road. But today we've got an other form of extremism. We've got extreme punishment. The author of extreme punishment, Stephen B. Epstein. I got the middle initial correct, right, Steve? Yes. All right. So let's uh, tell everybody in the audience who Steve is. Stephen B. Epstein is a native of Long Island, which I call Strong Island. Graduated not once, but twice from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, not a shabby school, Michael Jordan's uh, alma mater. Uh, First with a bachelor's degree in political science, 1987 and then with a law degree in 1990. Uh, Steve's writing career began more as an accident than an ambition, a midlife crisis of sorts. Uh, Steve, I'm interested in that since I'm currently in my own midlife crisis. Uh, you've written three true crime thrillers. So what happened? You, you hit your 50s and you said, uh, I can't just be a lawyer my whole life. I got to try something else. What, what went on in that mind of yours? I don't have the foggiest idea, but I didn't have enough money for a shiny red sports car. So I decided to dabble in writing. And uh, lo and behold, I was finished with a book a couple of years later and decided to try and get it published. And lo and behold, it got published. And three books, two two additional books later, here I am. Well, let me tell you something. My dad, who's going to be 89 next month, in 1971, wrote a book called Humanistic Psychiatry from Oppression to Choice. He's a retired psychiatrist. You can get that, a free plug for you, Dad. You can get that on Amazon Amazon for about a nickel somewhere. Um, He claims that if it was written today and it wasn't written as cryptically as he wrote it as a quote-unquote academic, it would be a number one bestseller. So I have actually started to write myself. I am writing a book kind of about life conversations between Carmela and I called Surviving the Survivor based on this podcast, and that I hope to have out. And then maybe I'll rework my dad's book, but I can't afford the shiny red sports car either. So I'm, I'm getting into the writing mode and I'm going to pick your brain about that as well. But, uh, your books have been featured as well as you on a little show called NBC's Dateline. Uh, you've done a lot of TV news broadcasts. You've done UK talk radio, YouTube videos, and of course now the number one thing surviving the survivor. So Steve, without further (laughs) ado, Without further ado, obvious first question. You've written three books. Why uh, the Dan Markell case? Well, my second book was written about another fairly famous murder in Tallahassee, the Mike Williams murder. He was the duck hunter who disappeared at Lake Seminole. Lo and behold, 17 years later, they discover that he was murdered all those years before. I got to become pretty good friends with his mother, Cheryl Williams. And uh, after I finished writing the book, we continued to have conversations and we still do to this day. And she put a bug in my ear when she was asking me what I was writing about next. She said, you ought to think about writing about the Dan Markell case. And I knew little bits and pieces about the case because when I was researching the Mike Williams case in the local newspaper, the Tallahassee Democrat, there often were side by side stories on both cases. And so I knew it existed, but I knew virtually nothing about it. And then mysteriously, on my DVR at home one night, um, a Dateline episode mis- just showed up on our um, saved shows. I have no idea how it got there, but it was the Dateline on the Dan Markell murder case. And I watched it, and I was pretty transfixed by the story. And one of the talking heads was a guy named Matt Share, who did the Over My Dead Body 
podcast, which was downloaded ultimately some 30 million times. So I decided my next step was to listen to that podcast. And after I did, uh, I was completely sold that this was something that I wanted to do, even though I really didn't want to write about Tallahassee, Florida, another two years. But over the last two years, that's what I did. And you have no real connection to Tallahassee, right? None whatsoever, other than having written two books about it. And so I, I know nothing about the uh, Michael Williams case, but there are some similarities, I guess. Can you kind of very quickly compare and contrast? And I think uh, it was a case where one witness really changed the entire outcome of that Michael Williams case years later, correct? It was. So his, what happened was his best friend and his wife were having an affair behind his back and decided that their best path forward was just to off him, to kill him. Um, and ultimately, uh, years and years later, A, they got married, and then B, they separated and had a very rocky relationship to the point that um, Brian Winchester, the best friend, kidnapped his ex-wife, Denise Williams. And lo and behold, he winds up in jail and eventually confesses to having shot Mike Williams all those years before. Uh, and the, the biggest similarity is that Cheryl Williams has not been able to see her granddaughter. Uh, she has one granddaughter born to Mike Williams uh, for all these years because the killers um, kept her away from her grandchild. And that is obviously a big similarity with Ruth and Phil Markell and Dan's children. Very interesting. And this is why I have no friends, Carm. Can she, can she see them now? today no she has even though denise williams is in prison she's an adult so angeli williams is now i believe 23 years old she's a uh, master's student and she has no entry she's been brainwashed all these years because she was raised by her father's killers and they led her to believe that her grandmother cheryl williams was simply crazy and uh there's no hope really that uh, cheryl williams is going to be reunited with her granddaughter angeli Again, Carmela, why I don't have friends? Because your friends can sleep with your wife, and it ruins your life. And no, you. you I, and, I agree with you. You have to be paranoid and, about your friends. And, and you totally. End, you end up dead. So a couple of real quick things I forgot to mention. Obviously, Steve Epstein is the author of a upcoming book, Extreme Punishment. It is actually coming out on uh, Dan Markell's 50th birthday. Why, why that date? Obviously, it's a big uh, momentous occasion, but that is uh, just this past Sunday. Yes, as you know, as a further tribute to Dan Morikell, it seemed fitting. The timing was right. My publisher and I agreed that that would be the perfect day to release the book. Um, real quick, once again, a shameless plug for all of you listening. If you want to get on the Surviving the Surviving newsletter, just drop your email in the comment section. We are getting a ton of requests for that. Also, uh, Instagram, we're on Instagram at Surviving the Survivor and on Facebook, please like us and follow us there as well. Steve, in writing the book, um, how long from start to finish did it take you to write the book, first of all? It, it was literally two years ago that I had that conversation with Cheryl Williams, saw the dateline, and I, was, I started the, the work on the research in October of 2020. I was in Jim Geiger. I don't know if that name means anything. I was in Jim Geiger's living room in December of 2020. I was basically killing two birds with one stone. That was the 20th anniversary of Mike Williams' death. And there was a, um, a celebration of his life and a memorial of sorts for him then smack dab in the middle of COVID. But while I was in Tallahassee, I used that to meet with several folks involved in the Dan Markell case, including his next door neighbor, Jim Geiger and sat with him in his living room, both wearing masks, listening to the story of what happened to him on July 18th, 2014. He literally paced me through his steps that morning. And that's the ch chapter one of my book starts in Jim Geiger's living room, just as my writing process started in his living room. He was the next door neighbor who discovered Dan shot in the head. Um, Carm, I saw your hand yeah. starting to raise. Um, in order to not experience any major guilt uh, from the very beginning, I have to confess, I, so far, I got the galleys before the book came out uh, for this occasion, and I read 347 pages. And you said something that it's a 500-something five, page book? 530, yes. And I have to tell you, um, the only reason I didn't finish the book was outside circumstances in my life, but it's so suspenseful and so well written 
even though you know every step where this move, where this book will go and what happened, and you already are saturated with information, you, I was still sitting there, like at the edge of my seat, reading the book. I thought it was very well uh, written in the sense of being a suspense story. Thank you. So Thank I you. recommend it. Uh, uh, the last book I read was James and the Giant Peach in third grade by Roald Dahl. And this one was uh, fantastic. It was, uh, I mean, it, I, it was the same thing. I was page turning. My kids are asking me okay, why I'm staring. Okay, confess how many pages did you turn? I, I'm a, I want to say 329. I'm in the ah, 300s. He's, he's I'll show you right now. It's on here. Okay. Don't make me embarrassed. Well, you haven't gone to Charlie's arrest yet, and and that story hasn't been well told. So I'm I'm thrilled that uh, I'm really the first storyteller who is telling the, the no, story. No, I am so looking impressed. forward. Yeah, and well, and we will. We are looking forward to that. Yes, a hundred percent. Um, so I'm curious about one thing before we get into the meat and potatoes of all this. How do you? Um, so you're an attorney by day. How do you structure yourself in terms of writing? How much do you write? Do you make yourself write a certain amount of a day? How does that work for you? I, I don't. You know, everybody's different, and I've heard that John Grisham and Stephen King have regiments like that. Of course, they're professionals and they make millions of dollars. I'm an amateur and I make tens of dollars. So my. Uh, it's a little bit different for me. I, I tend to burn the midnight oil. I tend to do a lot of weekend writing and I tend to unfortunately wake up a lot earlier than I want to uh, and get seized with an idea or some inspiration. So I just write when seized with the inspiration. Um, and I do my research when I have time. And I, if I have a slow day at work, I use some time at work. Um, and so it all depends. And uh, I am, it's a hobby for me more than it is an avocation. I think if it became a career, um, it, it would get too structured and I wouldn't want to do that. Interesting. So, um, in the course of writing the book, is was there one thing? I know that's asking a lot, but was there one thing that really jumped out at you that in, in this entire pro process, one thing that you learned or discovered that you said, "Wow, this is critical. I never knew this." Um, I know it's asking a lot to pick one thing, but maybe one or two things. I, I don't think so. I think what makes this story so fascinating, this may get to your other question of why I wrote this book, is that there are so many layers, so many layers to this story. I mean, starting with the fact that if you think about what was going on in the courtroom, for instance, during the first trial, I mean, you've got a collection of people who hail from pretty much everywhere on earth. Um, you've got Tara Kawas, who is Katie McDonough's attorney, who hails from Jamaica. Uh, you have... Uh, Katie McBanawa herself, who hails from the Philippines. Um, you've got Luis Rivera, who hails from Puerto Rico. Um, Sigfredo Garcia, whose parents came to this country from Cuba. Um, you've got a couple of natives in, in that. You've got um, Georgia Kappelman, who's a native of Tallahassee, but even she has an interesting backstory. Her father uh, was an NFL quarterback um, and played for the Florida State Seminoles, one of the most decorated quarterbacks in Florida State history. So just, and you got Sam Zangane, uh, who is Sigfredo Garcia's attorney. Uh, his father was, was a leading figure in the Shah of Iran's army. Um, so um, I knew that. just fascinating yeah. um, life stories of all of these people. And then Dan Markell and his family, they're not from Florida. They're not from America. They're Canadians. Um, and who, then was, you, who, was, uh, who was George's father? Who was the NFL George's father was Bill Kappelman. Bill Kappelman, who played for the Minnesota Vikings and the Detroit Lions. Uh, wow. So it's, you know, the, the, the life stories, the backstories of all these people are fascinating. Yet they're, they all converge. All those lives converge in a courtroom in Tallahassee, Florida, to resolve what happened on July 18th, 2014. Uh, and then you have the whole Jewish story, which is, you know, all these people, you know, the, the Markel family, the Adelson family, they're Jewish. But some of the biggest clashes in the marriage and some of the biggest things tearing at the post-marriage relationship between Dan and Wendy were how Jewish he was compared to how Jewish she was and how Jewish those two children were going to be raised. And Donna Adelson was as livid about that as anything else. That's wild. Um, how about access? I'm curious about this. Um, how many people did you speak to in the writing of the book? How hard or easy was it to get access? Uh, so I purposely don't try and get access to people who are going to be pivotal players on the witness stand, because as a lawyer, it's a little bit weird because I have ethical responsibilities not to talk with people who might be represented by counsel. So I stay away from people that are central witness stand people. But outside of that, I spoke with all of the lawyers 
extensively. Um, many, many of Dan's friends, some of Wendy's friends, the Markell family many times. So lots and lots and lots of access. And again, I'm curious, how does that work? Do you set up like extensive phone interviews? Because I'm sure you do something and then you've you're like, oh man, I should have asked about this. Or you in, do you have a relationship with these people where you can text them and say, hey, I forgot to ask you, what about this, this, and this? I mean, is it that kind of relationship? All, all of the above. And so um, it's, I, I, there are some sources that I can't reveal because I spoke purely on the basis of background. Um, but for instance, in constructing the narrative about Charlie Adelson's arrest, there was some of that where like, well, is it, did it really happen this way or that way? And so, yeah, so there was follow-up with um, with several people and, um, you know, for instance, Georgia Kaplan, I spoke with on numerous occasions as different parts of the story unfolded. I spoke with her in the courtroom during the, the second trial. I was there during the second trial. So I actually rode up the elevator with Tara Kawas the, um, uh, the day she gave her closing argument. And so in the story, you'll learn that she hadn't had a wink of sleep uh, before she delivered her closing argument just a few months ago. Well, it's because she told me in the elevator going up, I didn't have a wink of sleep last night. Wow. And there's a lot of conversation in the book that's that's detailed and it's interesting. One of the things, Carm, that I found fascinating, uh, but no one else would, is I had no idea that Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera are our neighbors. I, you know, they're from 71st and Collins, basically. I didn't uh, know that. So you didn't pay attention when you were reading? I didn't that see was that. In, did you really read the book? I r- <laughs> Carm, you would know that. I mean, they literally live. Sigfredo yeah, I Garcia. Never, I never saw the address. Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera both are from Seventy First and Collins, which is directly smack in the middle of where my mother and I live. Um, like, like the it's midpoint. A little, it's a little uh, Latino enclave on Miami Beach. I, I was, and so was Katie Magbanua. She was from there as well. So, I but thought not Latino. Really inter- Filipino. Not Latino. Filipino. But yeah. she, allegedly, she speaks the Spanish very well. Yeah, learned it in Miami. So, are she you? Was a, a, she's a college graduate. Yes, she is. Are you able to tell us? I mean, did you get access to to Wendy? I know you, to, or any of the Adelsons. Um, so it's funny you should ask that. Um, I didn't make any attempt to get access directly to Wendy. Um, I was trying to get up with some of her friends. Jane McPherson was somebody I wanted to talk to because. Jane McPherson, if you'll remember, was in the interview room with her the day of the shooting. Just um, the murder. The, the day of the, of the murder, yes. Um, and I reached out to her. I also reached out to this guy named Daniel Sack, uh, who was the other Daniel, uh, who Wendy was dating shortly after her marriage to Dan Markell ended. Um, and the, within a few hours of when I reached out to those two individuals by email, because anybody who's in the academic world, it's easy to find their email address. I reached out to the two of them and I came to my computer one morning and looked and saw an email in my inbox from Wendy Adelson, uh, which was shocking to me. And Wendy wrote me and I've got it in front of me. Dear Steve, my apology for the intrusion, but my friends have contacted me about your interview requests. As a central character in your writing, I'm curious why you haven't contacted me. Most sincerely, Wendy. Um, <laughs> wow! You can when imagine did he, my shock. Can you tell us? Can you tell us when you got this email? Is this in the middle I got of the process? It on March twenty second, two thousand twenty one. So some five or so months into my process of working on this book. Wow! Um, so, so what was your reaction? I, what, what was your reaction to getting that? My reaction in getting that is she's messing with me, um, and that she knows I'm writing this book. She's going to make sure none of her friends talk to me, and that this was not genuine in any way, shape, or form. However, I humored her and sent an email back saying, you know, I don't want to talk with you about the murder or anything like that. I'd like to know some backstory on your family, your appearance on The Weakest Link. Um, If you'd be willing to talk with me about those things, I'd love to talk with you. I just assumed you wouldn't be willing to talk with me and never heard another thing, uh, which was exactly what I expected would happen. So I reached out to her a second time. Um, The second time I reached out to her was in October. So some six, seven months later. Um, and I said, you know, I, I responded to you and I haven't heard anything back. I'm wondering if you got my email. And she responded uh, immediately saying, Steve, you do not have my consent to use my identity and trauma for your own profit. Best, Wendy. So that's those are my interactions with Wendy Adelson. So what was that? What did, how did she phrase that? You don't have my consent to what? What did she say? Do not have my consent to use my identity and trauma 
for your own profit. Uh, from a legal standpoint, there's there's no footing there, obviously, because this is a uh, case that's on the public record, right? I assume there's no yeah, legal Yeah, and she's a very well-trained lawyer and knows that, so it was almost humorous to receive that email. Let me ask you, because uh, a lot of people in the podcast world covering this case have uh, heard from her attorney, John Loro. Were, were you approached by him at all? Never. Interesting. Interesting. Um, and you haven't, do you expect to be, to hear from him once the book is officially released? I, I wouldn't know. I, I don't know that we need to have any, or despite what Wendy was saying that I, you know, I didn't have permission to use her identity. As you said, you know, her identity is very much part of the public record and narrative on this story. And uh, as long as I am not saying things that are libelous, which are, you know, statements of fact that are untrue or recklessly indifferent to the truth I have in this country, first amendment rights to express myself. Very interesting. You know, it's uh, neither here nor there, but Carm, I think I was telling you, uh, obviously the Jewish holidays are happening right now. And uh, I live in a small community in Miami Beach, and I'm starting to meet a lot of people who know Wendy from other circles because she lives in the neighborhood. Um, and it's interesting to hear the different perspectives. Uh, kind of came up on the last show because the phenomenal astute attorney john singer his wife is from down here and the same situation with him he knows some people in the same circles let, let me chime kind of, in that john john was kind enough to do a review quote uh, for me so in the front of my book i have six review quotes uh for people who read the book and commented on john is one of them and i only learned of him because of your fantastic show so thank you oh, for I, that well john is uh both my mother and my Excellent producer Steve Cohen make fun of me that I've got a man crush on John Singer, which is definitely not far from the truth. But uh, they don't come smarter than that guy. Although I just found He's exceptionally out articulate, exceptionally articulate, uh, and, I, uh, and I found out, which made me feel good, that he's actually the black sheep of his family. His wife is uh, inf infinitely more intelligent, apparently, according to him, than he is. So I feel better because <laughs> I'm the black sheep of my family. But without further ado, let's. So we actually had the pleasure of having a uh, former Tallahassee based assistant state attorney, Jeremy Mutz on our podcast mm -hmm. recently. He's a, he's a smart guy, very uh, measured, uh, very, very sharp thinker. And he remarked on our podcast saying, look, this is not the same case as it was in 2016. Um, we've learned a ton. He said, uh, since the, uh, over my dead body podcast, which is what you alluded to, I think you said 30 million downloads. I thought it was 10, but in any case, it was a ton of downloads uh, when they did a, a show on the Dan Markell murder case. Now, that aired in 2019, but the podcast relied almost exclusively on content from 2016, three years before. Um, so, again, Mutz says it's a totally different case. How did, um, as you were writing this book over this two-year period, how did this emerging evidence affect your writing and your thought on the case? Well, I so when I started writing the book, there was tr trial number two. The, the mistrial had already occurred for Katie McVenowa. Sigredo Garcia had already been convicted and spared the death penalty. Um, and there was a new trial date. And of course, we're in the middle of COVID. There's a new trial date of October 2021. I think October 4th of 2021. So and I'm starting to really get into the nitty gritty of the book in the spring of 2021, thinking, you know, I'll finish the book when that second trial takes place and I'll be able to wrap that into a nice bow. Little did I know that October of 2021 would ultimately become May of 2022. But there was a ton of information that was unearthed just from 41 minutes of clarified audio. That, those 41 minutes of clarified audio uh, that, the that, Dolce. That, that Keith McElveen, who's from as an audio forensics expert, former CIA investigator from South Carolina, that he is single-handedly responsible for. I mean, it broke this case wide open. It's why I was able to essentially tell the rest of the story. And uh, that only happened in the spring of 2022. By the way, Carm, Dolce Vita, I didn't know this either, is in Sunny Isle, Isles, which is- And a, it's not called Dolce Vita. Somebody added to it Vita. It's called Dolce. Who added? What are you talking about? It's V-I-T-A. But anyway, Carm- No, I, it's, I, I read somewhere- that the restaurant, the, you will not find a restaurant called yeah, Dolce Vita. It, you will find a restaurant called Dolce. Maybe because my daughter's name but is I love, But I love the word uh, Dolce Vita. Carm, what's your question? Well, my question is, um, y your book 
is coming out and you don't have insider information, how will it proceed from this point on, okay, the, the situation? And you kind of cut it by publishing the book. Are you planning to do a second volume or what are you thinking? Uh, an, yeah, the story's uh, not okay. over yet. No, by the, the way, story's Carmen, not over, I, but, yeah. but, but the way I describe it, I told a story of a man uh, who was an exceptionally gifted uh, academic uh, who met a woman who also, uh, her she, backstory right. uh, is, is incredibly um, um, high academic achiever as well. Those two people fell in love. They had children. Um, they wound up in this strange place called Tallahassee that neither really wanted to be. Um, and then um, the marriage broke apart and it became very ugly and he winds up dead. Um, and so my story, I think, reaches closure sufficiently well. And when you both get to the end, I hope I hope you'll agree that whatever happens from here isn't really necessary to tell this story of what happened to these two people who fell in love, had this horrible, bitter divorce. And then one day in July of 2014, two bullets are in the head. Of Professor Dan Markell and, and why that happened. I think why that happened is answered perfectly well in the pages that I've written. And 530 pages, thank you, I think is more than enough to tell this story. <laughs> um, so I want to, there's some audience questions and also I definitely want to get to a couple of excerpts, but the, the, and I apologize, I forget who this is from. I don't always write down the name, but in this instance, I did not. Um, and again, I know there's some certain things that you are not comfortable or comfortable with, so you tell me if you're able to answer this, but this person writes, are there any, in all caps, instances or actions from Wendy prior and post-murder, that because we're talking about loose ends, that are a loose end or leave you with any doubt of her innocence, in your opinion? Yeah, and I don't want to, so I, I've chased that rabbit down a rabbit hole before, and that's really not my book. My book is not telling the story of whether Wendy Adelson is innocent or guilty. What I will say is, with respect to her, there's likely information that I never became privy to that are in the hands of prosecutors and investigators, and I don't know what that information is. So that's part of the rest of the story that will be told by others, but it's not part of the story that I tell. And we've heard, um, and this is interesting, we just had again, we talked about the great John Singer. He was on, uh, we, talk, we hear about 57,000 documents being entered into discovery and something like 6,000 surveillance videotapes. Have you, is the 57,000 is a pretty uh, a hard and fast number. And John Singer, as an attorney, says, look, it's not even really that much. He gets that, that volume in his own uh, case files. But have you heard about 6,000 surveillance videos? Have you heard about that number? No. What I do know is that there, there was a surveillance camera, and this goes back to 20. 2016, there was a surveillance camera that was outside the townhome that Sigfredo Garcia and Katie McDonough lived in um, that was basically on 24-7. So what that translates into, I don't know, but they they knew about their whereabouts back and forth from that townhouse pr pretty much every day. Uh, the other statistic that I do know about is Charlie's iCloud account, where there are 300,000 text messages and, you know, I've only seen probably about 15 or 20 of them. So what the other, you know, 299,000 plus show, I don't have the foggiest clue. And we always say that you don't know, what, you know what you know, and you don't know what you don't know. Carm, do you think you could physically text 300,000 times, Carm? I am not, I'm, I'm a very uh, oral person. I don't. I don't even have an identity on Facebook. I put Roy on. Carl, by husband. the way, you called me out about how many pages I've read, which I'm being, I'll take a lie detector test on it. But do you know where that, he talked to, Steve just talked about a camera that was on Sigfredo Garcia and Katie Magbano's house. What was that camera affixed to? Let's see if you read the book. What was well, that camera affixed to? There was a camera. I don't remember that. That the that. feds were sur you don't remember a lot, Carm. No, I don't. I am entitled to it not. It was affixed to a telephone pole. I, Steve, I was going correct? to bluff correct. and say that you because- You could read 347 pages, but if you don't read it and you don't, under, don't remember it, then it wasn't like you read it, Carm. Joel, I read, I read, I was scrolling down on my thing and reading every word. Did you say crawling oh, or scrolling? Scrolling. scrolling. Okay. Carm, we have an but, important uh, author But the here. thing Let's, is, the thing is, Joel, that I didn't, re this is to me, not the essential, it, it doesn't carry the story forward if it was on a pole or if it was on a, on a, on a truck 
or it was Steve. As an author yourself, did, were you able to read? So obviously, both Dan and Wendy have written books, which is interesting. Did you read both books, and uh, what did you think of each? And how, how are they the similar? How are they different? Or how are they not similar? And how are they well, not? Well, different? Dan, Dan's book um, was a intended for an academic audience, whereas Wendy's book was intended for a lay audience. And in fact, she said in in her um, in her um, postscript that's why she wrote it. She wanted the stories of human trafficking victims to be much more accessible to ordinary people. Um, Dan's book was actually the compilation of, of law review articles he had written with two other law professors. And so Dan's book was about, um, it's called Privilege or Punish, and it's about the way that law either gives benefits to people because of their family relationships, like the marital privilege, you know, that we can't be forced to testify against our own spouse. And also some of the, the negative things that the law Voiced upon us simply because of our family relationships, such as laws on incest. You know, if we have sex with a sister or brother, we can be prosecuted simply because they're a family member. So that's what Dan's book was about. He actually had some very interesting views in that book on incest and why, in his view, in some instances, the law ought to leave people who engage in incest alone. Uh, Wendy's book was all about the plight of human trafficking victims, but she did it in a novel, in a fictionalized way. Um, and although a lot of people have heaped just enormous criticism on that book and, you know, whether it was a horrible book or the worst book ever written. And if you read some of the reviews on Amazon, people use those words. I actually found the book suitable for the purpose intended, which was to shed light on what it looks like to be the victim of human trafficking and to do it in a way that tells a story. What's important for my purposes about her book is that it says everything about what was going on in her marriage because the person who was the protagonist husband uh, she, the 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 protagonist was Lily Walker Stone who was very much like Wendy Adelson she basically had the same job Wendy did which was helping people involved in human trafficking and her husband was a professor at a fictional North Florida State University and their marriage dissolved over the course of the pages of her book this is our story and if you read everything that was going on, there were so many similarities between what was going on in her own marriage and what was going on in the fictional marriage that a lot of it was clearly autobiographical. Interesting. Now, there's another kind of twist here with the book, uh, with, with Wendy's book, and that's that there's essentially a narrative out there that Dan or Danny, as everyone called him, didn't respect Wendy's work. But witnesses, I think it even came up in testimony at one point, said that uh, – Dan did, in fact, validate and promote energetically Wendy's work to his many circles. Um, so what do you think about this allegation from Wendy that that Danny didn't even read her novel? You think there's any merit to that? That's consistent with this with sources that I um, spoke with. Yes. But let me let me put that all in context. A. Wendy also wrote academic articles that were placed in law journals, just like the, the academic articles Dan wrote. They weren't in prestigious law journals like Dan's writing, but she placed articles in academic journals. And Dan was helping her with those, just like he helped his colleagues at Florida State and other law professors around the country. And Dan was the first person Wendy acknowledged and thanked in her initial footnote in those articles. But this was fiction. And so those around Danny have said Dan didn't read fiction. Fiction is not something that he was particularly enamored of. He didn't like the, the whole concept of he had only so many hours a day and he preferred to be reading uh, academic or other nonfiction work. I mean, I'll give you a, a good analog. My wife, who I love to, to pieces and is the greatest thing in my life, she hasn't read my three books because she can't read true crime. It just, it turns her stomach to read true crime and it gives her nightmares. So I respect the fact that my wife hasn't read my books. My fourth book is gonna be a novel and she says like, show me every page of that book, I'm ready for it. It's funny, right before we went on air, the our studio engineer, Sal, great guy, and I were discussing the Jeffrey Dahmer Netflix series and Carmela, what did you say? Don't talk about that, this guy, I can't. No, what I said, I what said, that's doing? what you did with your time yesterday. It's a watching, fascinating mind. Watch, a, watching. Um, by the way, the actor in that is incredible. It's a fascinating. Watching mind. the documentary about that. Wow. I, I don't, watch I that. Think you know why I, I watch that? I, I personally am prejudiced in favor of fiction. I think that um, when I went back to graduate school, I was like anxious 
And um, this was nothing fancy. It was a master's in social work. I was very, I was anxious of starting uh, in this country um, graduate school. And I asked one of the professors who lived in the neighborhood, how should I prepare for it? And, and she said, read a lot of novels. Because, you know, a, a good novel is about life. Yeah. And, and it's just in a dif different uh, uh, format and structure. So, so the fact that, that some people, to me, a person who doesn't read fiction is a very dry person. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You you know why I watched Dahmer? Why? One reason. It makes me feel a little better about myself. It could it could be a lot worse for me. If, if I can well, say one more thing about the whole, you know, did did Dan read Wendy's novel? Dan sure. did promote Wendy's novel, so he was, as you know, I think one of the co-founders of Prof's blog. He was the most contri uh -huh. most significant contributor to Prof's blog, which itself was getting um, a quarter of a million downloads per month or or hits per month. And he promoted her book, This Is Our Story, on Prof's blog. Um, he promoted it among the Florida state community. And he actually went with her to some of her speaking engagements, including in her hometown in South Florida. So he was very much behind her being an author. Uh, but it is equally true from my sources that he didn't read the pages of the book because it was fiction. Now, in your book, you also you you report that uh, Wendy's coworkers at the University of Miami who worked there for a short period of time were not impressed with her. You said um, there's obviously been a lot of discussion about the fact that they were on uh, different intellectual levels. Does that kind of go without saying? And I'm just curious, were these Wendy's coworkers or Dan's at the University of Miami where you were getting that information? Are you able to tell us that? So, I mean, this is, I think, the most, the, my, my primary source for this information it literally began telling me about this whole episode by, by telling me he, he's, he has nightmares about this. Because Dan, and this isn't a well-told part of the whole Dan Markell, Wendy Adelson uh, story, but Dan did get a position at the University of Miami uh, very early in his career, one year into teaching at Florida State. And, you know, they were not looking to remain in Tallahassee. That was not their goal. And so he had this opportunity, what's called a look-see visitorship, for one semester teaching on the faculty at the University of Miami. And as part of his package deal, Wendy wound up getting a job within their clinic. Um, and clinical legal education is all has always been viewed as the redheaded stepsister of legal education. Law professors who are clinicians typically don't have tenure in most law schools. They typically don't have a vote for faculty meetings. Um, so. Wendy wound up in the clinic um, at the University of Miami while Dan was on the main faculty, although only as a visitor. And the reason why this person still has you know, nightmares about this is had Danny gotten a permanent job there, well, then they would have lived right there in the backyard, basically, of Harvey and Donna Adelson and Charlie Adelson. And this whole issue of the kids being seven hours away, it never would have arisen. But Danny didn't get that job. And as I described it from my sources, there were different factions in the faculty meeting that decided whether he was going to get the, the permanent position. And he it was like a whisker close vote. And what broke it against him in part was that the clinicians who at the University of Miami did have a vote to determine who would become a faculty member. They didn't like Wendy. They thought she was doing a poor job. Mind you, Wendy was literally just out of law school. She was a brand new lawyer and the work that she was doing from what I was told was a negative in Dan's faculty vote because those people realized that if Dan wound up on the permanent tenure track faculty, Wendy would become a fixture at the clinic and they didn't want to be responsible for cleaning up what they found to be incorrect work. You know, I'm fascinated by the fact, Carmelo, that life, as you know, and I know, is literally a game of inches. So Steve's talking about the fact that yeah. If Dan had a job at the University of Miami, maybe he'd be alive today. Didn't work out. Uh, I wanted to read some excerpts. This jumped out at me. I literally wrote Game of Inches here. This is an excerpt from the book when Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera are driving up to Hall Tallahassee. This is from Steve B. Epstein's Extreme Punishment out this past Sunday. And it reads, they were actually pulled over at one point, he noted, which was scary because he was on probation and could have been taken to jail immediately. But after examining, this is police, his license and writing up a speeding ticket, 
The officer merely told him to slow down and wear a seatbelt. I looked at Garcia and I told him, this mother effer didn't take me to jail. Getting pulled over, he said to Garcia, was a sign, man. We should just turn around. But So they got pulled over by the police. I bring that up. On their way up to Tallahassee, they had a gun in the car, presumably, right, Steve? And uh, Dude. police police just let them go. Um, but that was the first trip. At the time, so trip. what you're reading um, is from uh, the proffer statement of Luis Rivera, uh, where he's telling Craig Isom and Pat Sanford, Craig Isom from the Tallahassee police and, uh, and Pat Sanford from the FBI, he's describing what he thinks at the time he's describing it is the actual murder trip because he's confused. Rivera thinks that he got pulled over during the murder trip. He actually got pulled over on June 4th, uh, the day that they went up for the first trip to Tallahassee, where they never uh, were able to get Dan in their sights and, and do the job then. Interesting. So listen, I mean, I have a whole series of questions, and this is honestly not on here, but you know, there is a little bit of an elephant in the room, and I want to give you the chance to address it. You know, I know you went on Asian American Legal Focus. Um, you said some stuff about Wendy and you took a, a, some backlash. And I know you just mentioned a short time ago uh, that, um, you know, wasn't your intention in your book now, then, or I guess ever to decide whether Wendy is innocent or guilty. But do you want to just address? After he finished. Yeah. Would you, can you want to just address that for the audience? Because I know it was, you know, after you, you didn't expect the kind of response that you got, but there's a lot of avid, uh, you know, viewers, people who've been following the case closely, and they, they weren't thrilled with that. So I just want to give you the chance to respond to that. Sure, I will. And I've already began doing that. So unfortunately, um, my demeanor, I'm a New Yorker. I grew up in New York and um, I'm a lawyer. And when you combine New Yorker and lawyer, and I'm a courtroom lawyer, I can sound very, very sure of myself at times. And, and I actually share some similarities with Dan Markell. There were things that you know rub people the wrong way about Dan Markell. I acknowledge there are things that rub people the wrong way about me. And one of those is that I can seem very, very sure of myself. So when I was on that other program with Judy Sang, who's a friend of mine, um, I sounded very, very sure of myself about, you know, was Wendy involved? Was Wendy not involved? And I just listed some facts, which as a lawyer, uh, which, you know, my legal training uh, were important to me. Uh, but by no means was I intending to suggest that I have all these answers, or for that matter, that my book has anything to do with this question of was Wendy involved, was Wendy not involved? Obviously, Wendy's involved in the story. She's on many, many, many pages of this book, uh, but she's on the pages of this book not trying to examine, is she guilty? Is she innocent? She's on the pages of this book because she's a very important character in this story. Um, and I am not going to chase myself down that rabbit hole again. Uh, I'll leave it for others to talk about whether Wendy was involved. And again, there's tons of evidence that I don't know. And so what prosecutors and what investigators are privy to and whether they would eventually charge Wendy Adelson uh, with either a before the crime involvement or after the crime involvement, I truly have no idea and don't want to comment on any further. Thank you for answering that, Carm. I am not a lawyer. But you are always sure of yourself, so you have something in common. I sound like I'm more or less sure of myself, but the problem I find here, all of us who are following this story with a bated breath and want to know all the details and everything about it, we also take sides, uh, understandably take sides. I mean, it's not so difficult. It's not so ambiguous to take sides if you are pro Markel or pro Adelson. So we are all pro Markel. But we have to be tolerant of people. We always ask, what do you think who will go next on, on a trial? Who will be indicted? We have to be tolerant. We have to be open-minded. We have to discuss all the other possibilities. Because even if a person is to a degree guilty and she played it clever in a clever way like Wendy might have she may ha not have left tra traces and tracks behind her so that she will be able to waltz away from the whole story it's a possibility so don't attack the messenger who in, the, in this particular happened to be you and your book uh uh, you know, uh, open your mind and accept. Don't say, I hate this one or I love this one because they, they completely agreed with my view. 
one thing I do will tell you, and I promise, is you'll be riveted by the book. It is a page turner, as I oh, said. Oh, you agree? No, I, I have, said it. I, I haven't really. No, I'm not a. I'm not a voracious reader mainly because I don't have the time. Um, I prefer the UFC. No, uh, you prefer Dahmer. 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 Well, well you Dahmer. took a time out briefly to talk about me. I want to take a time out to talk about both of you, um, if I can, if I can have that personal privilege. Be uh, our guest only, only if us. you have nice words. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've watched um, probably 10 or more of your YouTube videos um, and listened while I've been at the gym as I've been pumping the iron uh, to both of you. And you all have done tremendous, tremendous work in bringing light and attention to the Dan Markell case. And um, I've seen Ruth interviewed on your show. Um, I've seen David Latt, who actually started out writing this book with me. Uh, he's wrote the forward to the book on your show. You have gotten great guests. You've asked great questions. But the most significant thing that you've done is you've broken news on your um, show. When Georgia Kappelman was on your show, and as you know, because you've mentioned, I mean, that interview was actually mentioned in court at Charlie Adelson's Arthur hearing. That's how significant your show has become. But when you had Georgia Kappelman, you asked her excellent questions, and you got her to reveal something that nobody else has reported on to this day, which is that they're not seeking the death penalty against Charlie. You broke that news on your show and you got her to explain why. Um, not the world's greatest explanation for why they're not going to seek the death penalty against Charlie, uh, which was that they couldn't get the death penalty against Sigfredo. So why pursue it against Charlie? But you broke that news. So you're blazing trails and I congratulate both of you for what you're doing. And I love listening to the banner between the two of you. It's uh, extremely uh, thank you. entertaining. Okay, this, this this we are happy to hear. That I will cut as a promo. Thank you so much, Steve. <laughs> One question for you. Has your wife listened to my podcast? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> she might listen to this one. <laughs> she's a tough. She's a tough. No, nut no, to no. Crack. The, uh, the, the best marriages are where everybody does their thing and they get together. Yeah, you and Dad were very different. Back to the back to the book. I appreciate that, Steve. The uh, now the 2022 trial um, included some new admissible evidence and testimony. Uh, one of the examples is a deleted text message from Wendy to Charlie. That's revealed for the very first time. Uh, that did surprise some people. And there was some new financial evidence related to uh, Wendy that was referenced by Georgia Kappelman. Um, did any of this new information affect your thinking as you were in the uh, final stages of, of finishing up the book when the trial occurred? No, and frankly, you'd have to share with me because I don't think I have either of those things in my book. So I think you'd have to share with me the specifics of that. I was actually at the trial during the second week and i don't recall any anything specifically raising my eyebrows boy i didn't know that um and of course by the time of the trial i knew every word that was spoken or at least captured in the enhanced recording from dolce vita i mean to me that was the bombshell new evidence and the other bombshell dynamic that changed everything about that second trial was the fact that charlie adelson was in jail and was not free, and it changed everybody's strategy about how to pursue both the prosecution and the defense. I, I'll, I'll email you some of that stuff. By the way, we had the great Vinny pa, uh, Politan on, a main core TV anchor, and he came on the record on our show last week and said he thinks that uh, Harvey's going down next. Uh, he's going to be indicted. Um, Neither here nor there. It's just we were talking about people making predictions, and I thought that was everybody is making predictions all the time. It's like all the Super the Bowl, um, yeah, but a little time. different. So who will who will who will squeal on whom, and who will et cetera, et cetera. So we've also we've heard a lot about encrypted communication, uh, about apps like WhatsApp. Um, are they recoverable? Are these recoverable, Steve? And uh, how could recovered messages change the face of the overall case? Well, according to the testimony from the first trial, and I believe it was Pat Sanford who answered those questions, who's the, the lead um, special agent from the FBI who's been involved in this case from day one, they can't be. So, you know, for instance, um, uh, FaceTime, you know, the fact that there was a FaceTime call is something that can be determined, but what happened during the FaceTime call cannot be. The same is true with um, for my understanding is with WhatsApp and other encoded messages. But there seems to be universal agreement that Charlie and Katie, at least, were using WhatsApp to communicate with one another. The bizarre thing is, if they were doing that, why weren't they doing so exclusively? Because they left so much, uh, both in terms of recorded conversations that were wiretapped, 
in terms of other communications with each other. They left so much to find if they had discovered WhatsApp as a back channel. It's bizarre to me that they only used it on a limited basis instead of all the time. And I, I, I have no idea what other um, types of encoded communications might have occurred, but WhatsApp is the one that's been mentioned a lot. But prosecutors and investigators, to my knowledge, have not been able to piece any meaningful information out of any of that. And when you mentioned that 300,000 text figure, that, that does not include WhatsApp messages, I take Correct. That, that, Correct. Okay. That's, that, those are, that's a direct quote from at least one of the trials, that that's what was in the, the text message, the SMS messages of Charlie Adelson. And that's despite the fact that he deleted a lot of them. Um. Again, not one of my questions here, because I, you know, having you on, I wanted to be pretty specific with what I was asking, which is not always my style. But any thoughts, one way or the other? I mean, do you think that there is, as an attorney yourself, do you feel that the web evidence against uh, Charlie is overwhelming at this point? Do you think he's taking a chance? You do. I do. I believe the evidence against Charlie, his own words. So the way I describe it, you have neither of you have gotten that far in the book. But the way I describe it, the epiphany. <laughs> that Georgia Kappelman had um, when Keith McElveen had finally produced these 41 minutes of enhanced audio from Dolce Vita, the epiphany she had was his words were tantamount to a confession. Uh, so you, you went from just having to understand the back and forth flow of all of the wiretap calls to one condensed 41 minute conversation where he literally says, well, why didn't they know it was me? I mean, how is that not a confession? And when he says, you know, when all of you were there the next day, did any of you take any of the money? I mean, how is that not a direct reference to the money drop that occurred the morning after the murder where Charlie's money is being used to pay off the hitmen? I mean, it's exactly what everybody else has described, including Luis Rivera and Jessica Rodriguez, who were both there at the time. And Charlie's referring to it directly in the, in the conversation he had with Katie. Those words were not audible prior to the enhancement. But they are now, and his lawyer, Dan Rashbaum, can run and hide and evade and obfuscate, but he can't run away from those words. They are Charlie's own words acknowledging his role, and that's the only rational and reasonable way to see those words. Then We've had a lot of discussion on the show since the preliminary hearing, I'm sorry, since the Arthur hearing, uh, and during that Arthur hearing, as you well know, um, Georgia Kappelman uh, presented the so-called Mitsuri tape, which we, you know, has been around for a little bit, but that was entered into evidence. Any thoughts as to why during the Arthur hearing, any kind of legal strategy there? Um, and again, it goes to show that we know what we know, but we don't know what we don't know. And potentially there could be a lot of other surveillance video like that. So I was aware that it was surveilled. Um, and what, what the, the thought that popped into my mind is, did they get Keith McElveen to enhance that audio? Uh, and I don't know the answer to that question because I was already done writing the book and I'm not trying to follow up. Um, but I was aware that that conversation was surveilled because it's in part of the investigation file that I was given as part of my work on this book. Um, and I wasn't aware that there was anything useful. So I was quite surprised that there was conversation that made it seem pretty clear that Harvey, by that point in time, was knowledgeable at the very least about the bump. Um, I didn't believe, when I had written the book initially, I didn't believe Harvey became knowledgeable about the bump until the letter showed up that was written by the undercover agent that was literally delivered to their condo in, in South Beach, and Harvey was the one who opened it. That is described in my book as well. I wasn't aware that just the day after the bump, when 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 Charlie had dinner with Harvey at the Matsuri restaurant, that they got useful information. But clearly they did. Um, it was interesting. This came yeah. up on the show as well. Um, Fancy Fiction, who I'm sure, you know, uh, she puts a lot of the wiretaps up um, and she had some stuff up regarding the Matsuri tape. And it was interesting. Um of all people, John Loro commented on her YouTube page. I asked John Singer about this and said because of the way they uh, recorded that and included personal conversation that it would be inadmissible in a courtroom. And John Singer's reaction was, I have no idea about the inadmissibility of that, but I also cannot fathom why John Loro would be commenting publicly on Fancy Fiction's 
YouTube channel. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, because my John Singer would have just ripped the thoughts right out of my head. So exactly what John <laughs> thought would be my two thoughts. Like, what the heck is he doing trolling fancy fiction? That's bizarre. And yeah. I, for the life of me, can't figure out why that would be inadmissible. So I do want to get back to a couple excerpts from the book. Um, I thought they were, the book, again, was fascinating. It was a real page turner. Um, and I didn't pick these for any other reason that at the time I was reading these, they sort of jumped out at me. This one has to do with Donna and Karm. I'm curious on, as to your take on this, uh, since she is the grandmother and the matriarch. On three separate occasions, the prior November, Dan wrote, uh, the boys told him, this, by the way, was during the divorce proceedings. So on three separate occasions, the prior November, Dan wrote, the boys told him, Abba, grandma says you're stupid. Asked why she'd say such a thing. The children replied jointly that it's because she says you are trying to take her sunshines away from her. During a phone call in December, while Wendy and the kids were in Coral Springs, Lincoln told them, Abba, which is a Hebrew word for father, grandma says she hates you. Dan expressed dire concern that, quote, continued exposure, exposure to such negativity forms the foundation for parental alienation. Carmela, first you as the therapist, what do you think of this behavior on Donna's part that she was calling the boy's father uh, stupid and saying that they hate him? That's Donna. That's Donna. Donna does horrible things. Horrible things. I mean, she's she doesn't care about damaging her grandchildren. And uh, from a legal standpoint, Steve, what what does that do for her? I mean, if anything, legally, or does it just paint her as a bad human being? Well, at the time, Dan was using that to, as you'll recall, to try and limit her contact with the children and. If you're trying to trace the arc of this story and you're presuming that it runs through the Adelson family, that was a very, very important motion. If you'll remember, Wendy was asked at both trials about that motion and she dismissed or minimized that motion as being completely insignificant and that nobody took it seriously. It's hard to imagine that Donna Adelson didn't take Dan Markell's motion to restrict her visitation because of those incidents seriously. Uh, with everything that Dan, with everything that Donna had written about, um, Dan in her emails to Wendy, uh, she had to view that as a as a threat. And she saw Dan winning at every turn in family court. So if Dan was asking for this restriction, it's hard to believe that Donna wasn't concerned about that restriction. And lo and behold, he's murdered a few months later. Now, back to um, these encrypted messages, which are becoming more and more intriguing. It turns out that Wendy had something called a cell bright analysis that was originally done in 2014. But then in 2019, they reanalyzed her phone using software that's potentially, potentially able to capture WhatsApp messages. Um, Steve, to you, why would you do this to Wendy's phone? Is, is it possible that they're now considering her a suspect? Well, I mean, I, I think they've considered all of the Adelson's potential suspects, except for Rob up in Albany, New York. Um, and they're... You know, they've had all this time, so they're constantly trying to refine and 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 increase the information that they have. And as they learn more, they're looking backwards as well as forwards. So it makes sense the same way they went and, and enhanced the Dolce Vita video uh, audio. It makes sense that they would take them. They've had Wendy's phone since day one. Uh, they were able to download it and they would have done the Celebrite um, Chris Corbett. Um, who is the lead investigator who does that kind of stuff with the Tallahassee police, he would have done a full celebrate um, an analysis back in 2014. But years later, there's potentially additional tools that are available, just like you were able to enhance an audio that wasn't uh, very useful before. And you'll keep doing that to try and learn as much of the truth as you can. That's what good investigators do. And uh, back to Georgia Kaplan, obviously the uh, prosecutor and all this, she asked Wendy, um, about various accounts she had gained control of after the murder. I know in your book you mentioned um, something I didn't know about, um, which was a $2 million life insurance policy out on uh, Dan. Um, and so there was much more than previously disclosed. No, but, but that $2 million is uh, You're lucky you interrupted the children, me and not but, Steve. On purpose. You're lucky you interrupted um, me and uh, not uh, Steve. Uh, uh, $2 the $2 million was for the children. 
the children are the beneficiaries, and and uh, they end. Uh, uh, is uh, Ruth's daughter is handling that? Uh, Carm's exactly okay. right, but there uh -huh. is some question as to when, whether Wendy would have known that. Then Dan changed those policy beneficiaries subsequent to his divorce with Wendy, but at some point in time during their marriage, Wendy had been the beneficiary uh, on those policies. So there's at least a, a legitimate question as to whether Wendy would have known that the children were the beneficiaries and that she wouldn't have access to that money. So then the obvious question there, is it possible that there was some sort of financial motive in addition to relocation motives no. with this? I mean, it's certainly possible, but if you'll remember, this is a wealthy family to begin with. I mean, Charlie Adelson was making between three and three and a half million dollars a year as determined by the state's financial analysts. So th these are not people who two million dollars would make as big a difference to as as most people because they already had millions of dollars. Um, so this is uh, another excerpt from the book here, um, which goes to Carm. Carm Carm has been calling out Harvey Adelson from day one. Why I don't know. Maybe it's a grandmother grandfather thing. But this is a, a projection. This thing. is a, it's a well, projection. Your husband is similar to Harvey in that he's quiet and sweet, and you're the domineering mother like Donna. But this but, is. Uh, but my husband puts his foot down. Like you can't push him beyond the point. So this is a short excerpt. Unfortunately. This has to do with some payment to Katie Magbanua, specifically a car. And uh, Steve Epstein writes, but what happened on January 23rd, 2016 was even more incriminating, which was, which was when Harvey signed the official title to the vehicle. I believe it was a Lexus, which bore his name rather than Charlie's over to Katie. So with that, I will ask you, uh, Steve, what do you think, and I don't know if you want to answer this, about Harvey's potential involvement in all this? Well, I remember, this is all after the fact. So there's tons of information after the fact about what all of these players are doing. So you've got signatures on documents, which are payoffs to Katie Magdanawa, one signature of Harvey's, 44 signatures of Donna's. What are those 44 signatures? 44 signatures check. on checks written by the Adelson Institute, many of them consecutively numbered. So that's equally suspicious. Um, to Katie, she's getting two a month uh, for the entire time period from September of 2014, all the way until just before Sigfredo Garcia is arrested. It is highly incriminating that the next check was never written, the one that would have come after Sigfredo Garcia was arrested. So, you know, are those signatures evidence of their pre, you know, their knowledge of this crime before it happened? Not necessarily, but at the very least, it would suggest that they're involved in the cover up or in keeping Katie Magdana walk quiet. And, you know, that's the other big story. The two, two big things everybody wants to talk about. Everybody. Did Wendy do it? Was she involved? And why the heck has Katie Magdana not squealed? on the Adelsons. And so the, the, what we're talking about now gets right to that question. All of the benefits that Katie has received from the Lexus to the breast implants to the 44 checks from the Adelson Institute that dried up literally days before Sigfredo Garcia was arrested. And there's tons of that. And that's why the prosecution rightly has put so much emphasis on that, at least in aiming their guns at Katie Magbanawa. As to why Katie continues to hold her silence as to Charlie Adelson, now that she has been convicted and is facing life in prison, that's a head scratcher. Yeah, I agree with you. You don't you don't have an answer yourself, I assume. I wish I no, did. But the, and and, and but maybe the that question, will change. The, maybe the question it will change. Is, is he answering why Charlie is not speaking? No, we're answering. Carm, where have you been? No, but I, I, I'm. Where have I, you been? Where I have, have you well, been? This relax, is one podcast. Relax, we're talking relax. about. People will yell at you. How are you talking to your mother? I know. It's unbelievable. No, By the way, I saw, uh, this is a shout out to Nick Kroll, who I don't even know. He's a stand-up comic on Netflix. And I caught a little, like, at, right before Dahmer, they play little clips. And Nick Kroll does a whole little, uh, what's the word in comedy? He does a whole, like. Stand-up. Uh, stand -up, whatever the word is. Anyway, he does a whole thing about how people react to their mother calling and how they have no tolerance. Oh, yeah. They already. Every, Everyone sees their mother calling. They're like, oh, 
And then like <laughs> their father can say like the craziest thing. And they're like, yeah, that's okay, dad. But the mother's like, you know, I didn't like your sport coat. No, no, I know you were yeah. talking about the Dana we're talking thing. About, no, we're talking about why did Katie McVanawa not spill the beans on the Adelsons? Why has she remained? Yeah, quiet? that was a question I asked just about everybody because everybody has a different theory on it or a similar one. But my question for you is what will will Charlie squeal? Um, so there will be plea negotiations of some sort with Charlie. There have to be, there always are. I mean, so I'm I do most I do civil cases, and there's never a civil case that I'm involved in where there's not a settlement discussion at some point. Th- there will be at some point some kind of discussions between the state attorney's office and Daniel Rashbaum, his attorney, as to what that looks like. I mean, it could be as simple as uh, he's willing to plead for a 25 year sentence if we can avoid trying him. I mean, it, it doesn't have to necessarily involve him spilling the beans on anybody else. Prosecutors make deals like that all the time. That's sort of the standard variety of a plea bargain because prosecutors don't want to expend the resources that you've seen what two of these trials look like. If they can get him behind bars for 25 or 30 years without having to put all of the time and resources in, he wouldn't necessarily even have to give up anybody. But if he has we, uh, more information that could lead to other arrests, then there maybe is a better deal for him. We had three ex-cons who served some serious time on the show. And across the board, they said that uh, they do think it was interesting perspective, but they do think Charlie will flip on somebody. They don't know who. Basically, their argument is they, these three guys happen to come from the street and there's a street code. And they said, we would never rat, we would never flip, but just that's how we were born and raised. But they said, look, this is a, this is a pampered, you know, upper middle class dentist, and he's not going to be able to handle the pressure. And by the way, he looked during that Arthur hearing, didn't look too well physically. So I wouldn't be uh, too surprised. Um, and and, and let, let me say one more thing, because a lot of people have talked about, you know, how Charlie is a narcissist and he believes he can beat this. Um, But you're ignoring the role of a lawyer in the process. He has a lawyer. He has a lawyer for good reason. Actually, he's now had his second lawyer. His first lawyer is gone. Interestingly, this current lawyer previously was representing Donna Adelson. So Rashbaum was previously representing Donna. He's now representing Charlie. But he has a role to play in this process. He's not a potted plant. And he has to be aware of the strength of the evidence against Charlie. So if Charlie is going to stand trial and get convicted and be sent to life, sent to prison for life, it's his job to see if there is something better than that, if the odds of him being convicted are extremely high. And he will. He will at some point see what he can work out, whether that's going to you know, be something that prosecutors would consider. Time will tell. And we're going to wrap this up in but, a few uh, minutes. But somebody said, uh, somebody said uh, he could even squeal on his mother. He could. He could squeal on anybody. The question is, will he? So on to another, uh, in, in light of what we're talking about right now, I thought this was interesting for a different reason. Again, this is from Extreme Punishment. Stephen B. Epstein, our guest, wrote, uh, this is Charlie on uh, the post bump, on Wendy uh, post bump. And uh, Stephen writes, whoever was blackmailing them, Charlie continued, thinks they're going to like try to solve this case and they think because we're the family that we had something somehow something to do with it so they're going to go ahead and be like and make some demands and see how we'll react what was even odder he told donna was that they're not bugging wendy because that would be the first person i would go to now this is his own word so it's a little convoluted but what i make of this if I was a juror and I was thinking about this, this is where if I was Rashbaum, I would play these types of excerpts uh, trying to confuse the jury pool because he kind of holds to his guns to a certain degree that they had nothing to do with this um, on on many of the tapes. Um, and then what, what I thought was further was more interesting about this. He then says they're not bugging Wendy because that would be the first person I would go to. And when I read that, I don't know, like lights went off over my head. Would he flip on Wendy? I think he's got some resentment at this point. Well, not at this point. He was um, uh, complaining to his mother how 
Wendy's the lucky one. She gets everything. She's a trust fund child. I don't know. Any any thoughts uh, on this excerpt of yours, Steve? Well, that expert, excerpt, I think, is just saying what, what the, the logic logic dictates, right? It's always the ex-spouse. So he, he's saying that there, that, you know, you would think they would go to, why are they bumping us? Why are, why, if this is law enforcement, why are they coming to us? Why aren't they going straight to Wendy? I don't read that to mean because of Wendy's involvement. I read that to mean because that's who's always involved, right? The ex-spouse. And I think that's what he's saying. Interesting. Okay. It is interesting. And it's new. It's a new variation on this theme. So another interesting excerpt. Now, now, Luis Rivera uh, was already, prior to his trial, was already arrested uh, on on, uh, federal charges and a lot of different federal charges, which I'm not going to list. And he says this about Wendy when he's being interrogated at a facility in northern Florida, I think north of Orlando. Why did he, Steve Epstein writes, why did he believe someone wanted Dan Markell dead? And he answers, Luis Rivera, because the lady wants her two kids back. Now, it's interesting because when I first read that, I was thinking Donna, right? I was thinking Donna wants her two kids back. And he says the lady, something in an old lady. Rivera explained, now making it crystal clear, the other lady was none other than Wendy Adelson. She wants full custody of them kids because he had all the custody. That was the plan. That was the deal. That's what we went to go kill that man for. Garcia had filled them in on all those details, he said, before they got on the road for their first trip. Carm, what do you, how do you interpret that? Because there's a couple ways to interpret that. If you interpret it literally, it sounds like Wendy was the one who put the hit out on, on Dan. But if you are a little more nuanced, it could just be that Donna or someone else. But no, but uh, but uh, in the book, it's clearly stated when he speaks about the lady, he refers to Wendy. To Wendy. Uh, right, but Steve, he doesn't what? know. So, so remember, Rivera is insulated. Garcia is insulated. You have all the, it's, it's exactly the way that, um, that uh, Georgia Kappelman describes it. It's like a train, right? You have all these cars in the train, and none of them are directly connected other than the ones connected to each other. So you've got Donna connected to Charlie, Charlie connected to Katie McBanawa, Katie McBanawa connected to Sigfredo Garcia, and Sigfredo Garcia connected to Luis Rivera. And Luis Rivera is getting the last bit of information. It's the classic game of telephone. So he's saying what he knows, but what he knows comes exclusively from Garcia. What Garcia is saying comes exclusively from Katie. What Katie is saying comes exclusively from Charlie, and so on. So you know, the Rivera is not someone anyone would suggest like would have been a, would have been aware that Wendy was directly involved because he By was the, way, the Steve, last car. He was the caboose. What you what, as you just answered that question, you were literally moving your hands. And for those who are listening, when you were writing this book, did you have to? I'm curious about this. Did you have to have like a whiteboard behind you with uh, what do they call that? Like a like a flow chart showing who goes like what happened when and where because it gets very complicated in a, in a sense. I, I didn't, but it you know it took me a long time to absorb all of the players and who they were and how they fit together. Yeah, it's complicated, and it's why it's five hundred and thirty pages long. Uh, but it's also five hundred and thirty pages long because I tell the story of Dan Markell, uh, his biography. So there's a chapter that is devoted entirely to his biography, a chapter devoted entirely to his and Wendy's careers. I mean, these are intensely interesting people um, who I mean, Dan had hundreds and hundreds of friends and acquaintances all over the world. I and mean, he was internationally renowned. And he also was someone that so many people thought so much of. So there is just a ton of interesting detail. Now we have another question and we're going to wrap it up in five minutes or so. Cause Carm is uh, getting, ant- you got spilkes, Carm, you know what that spilkes. is? Ants in your pants in Yiddish. Um, JC writes, there's one glaring omission in extreme punishment. There's no mention that Jeffrey Lacoste testified in 2022, but what he said was new and arguably important. Why leave that out? That's not correct. Um, I didn't go in. So there are a lot of people who testified a second time in 2022 that I didn't go into detail, but I did, in fact, talk about uh, Jeffrey Lacoste and his testimony in, in the 2022 trial. So, no, I didn't leave it out. But uh, by the time of the 2022 trial, I had to significantly condense what I was writing about so that the book didn't become 600 pages long. But yes, I did talk about Jeffrey Lacoste's testimony, which was 
largely um, identical to the testimony that he provided in 2021. Wendy's was entirely different, which is why I went into uh, Wendy's testimony in great detail. Which I, I am excited to get to that part of the book. You mentioned David Ladd off the top. Um, he was going to originally co-author the book with you. How And David, for those who don't know, is very well-respected. He was on our legal, podcast. He was on our podcast. He's another Harvard guy. He knew Dan. But uh, how come he ended up not writing the book with you? Uh, as it turned out, David was similar to my wife. Uh, he thought he had it within him to write a book about the murder of Dan Markell. But the more he got to the point where he was trying to start putting words to paper, the more he realized that this wasn't the genre for him. Um, he is just like it's not the genre for my wife. It's not the genre for everybody, for sure. Uh, so but he was kind enough to say, you know, I will do everything I can to help promote the book and I will do the forward to the book. And it's a lovely forward. Um, and I've met him. Um, we we are friends and uh, there's no hard feelings whatsoever. I wish we would have done it together. It would have been fun. Final excerpt from Extreme Punishment by Stephen B. Epstein. Uh, no rhyme or reason as to why this is the final excerpt, except like Steve himself. If we kept going, this would be a six hour podcast. So I got to wrap it up at some point. And this one is from we just had her on our show on Sunday uh, in honor of Dan's what would have been his 50th birthday. This is Tamara Demko. Uh, and Steve writes, this is from right after the murder. Um, there is a, a get together, I believe, at Wendy's home in Tallahassee and Stephen writes the most intriguing morsel she being Tamara Demko shared uh, was her interaction with Harvey and Donna Adelson at Wendy's house the prior day where Demko had gone to pay her respects even though she'd met Wendy's folks several times something about them seemed off she said Harvey in particular appeared uncomfortable seemingly unable to look at her in the eye. Demko indicated that she also was very suspicious of Charlie, who she believed hated Dan and was very protective of his sister. It quotes now from Demko, I wouldn't put it past her father or her brother to do something like this, Demko speculated, but expressed hope that Wendy herself hadn't been involved. First you, Carm, what do you make of that? The fact that right after the murder, this is yeah, a day there or two were, after the murder. Yeah, there were all sorts of awkward parts where Wendy, they wouldn't let Wendy alone with uh, with uh, Ruth Marquette because uh, they were, I guess they were afraid she would say something that would be whatever. Incriminating. Incriminating. And, uh, and uh, people, I think people knowing that there was a crime committed they can read into things. This is a very subjective thing. Carmen, yeah. let me say, hypothetically, you put a hit out on my lovely wife, Ileana. A, oh day, my God. a day after the murder, you think you'd, you're, you're... Uh, I am a psychopath. You, you I know think you would Would you be able to keep it together? Uh, well, if I did that, Would you then have made I, eye I contact? Would. Yeah, I think you have it in you. Carmel is a fine line between you and Donna Adelson. Oh, I saw Dahmer. Uh, and Dahmer. I don't like meat. Dahmer Adelson. Um, so, Steve, what do you, what do you make of that last uh, Tamara Demko uh, meeting with the, with the Adelsons right after the murder? I mean, the, at, at the, the memorial service at Shomre Torah, which is the Sunday after the Friday morning murder, I mean, everybody's you know looking at Harvey and Donna and Wendy. Charlie was not there. And trying to make heads or tails, I mean, that there were suspicions in the community immediately, you know, were these people involved? And of course, everybody's going to have their own perceptions of how, you know, somebody's behaving. Everybody's looking for evidence of a guilty conscience. Uh, conscience, And uh, it, it's hard to, you know, everybody's on edge. You, it's hard now, all these years later, to put yourself back into the mindset that all of these people would have had right in the midst of this murder. And remember, it was two years nearly before they arrested anybody. So. Everybody is just, you know, doing their best detective work into, is he guilty? Is she guilty? Um, fortunately, we now know several people who are. Um, and there's still a lot of this story to be told beyond what I tell. And so fascinating. Do you have any idea um, when you think the Charlie Adelson trial will actually begin? They say early 2023. Do you think because of the amount of discovery that it's going to be pushed back to summertime-ish or you have a timetable? There are so many variables and the most significant one from my vantage point is there going to be plea bargaining? Is there going to be somebody that comes forward, for instance, Sigfredo Garcia, 
or Katie Magbanawa, who now finally wants to talk. And any of those things can change that timeline very significantly. Now, so let me ask you. It's really hard to know. Will Donna Adelson, for instance, be arrested between now and then? All of those things can affect the timeline. One thing that I know it's come up, but hypothetically, Magbano or Sigfredo Garcia, if they came forward now, could they work out a deal with the prosecution? Is that still on the table? It is. And it's in the very last pages of the book when you finally get there. Okay. So I've made very sure I knew what I was talking about and spoke to two deans of, of the criminal law um, section of the Florida bar to make sure I had this right. And the answer is there are a bunch of hoops that would have to be jumped through by the prosecutors and defense attorneys, and ultimately a judge would have to approve it. But yes, they could still better their lives by coming forward and talking. They do not necessarily have to spend the rest of their lives in prison simply because they've already been sentenced to a life in prison. So if they had information, it would behoove them to share that information and try and get a better deal than they currently have. Interesting. The author yeah. is Stephen B. Epstein. The book is Extreme Punishment. What is the, what's the novel going to be about? Do we know? The novel I do, I've been waiting to write it until I could get this one finished. The novel is going to be about my two favorite subjects, golf and murder. Very nice. Um, they go hand in hand. Now, wait a minute. This book that we talked about now for over an hour, where can people get it? Great question. The best place to go would be Amazon. It's currently, it will be available as of the time this is aired in both Kindle version and also in print. Uh, and very shortly, the, there's already narration being worked on by a very talented narrator. The audible version should be available in about 30 days. Steve, if you were making uh, Grisham money, would you give up the law for, to be an author? Uh, if I were making Grisham money, I would do all kinds of things that I'm not able to do today. Yes. <laughs> you, would, you would just golf. Well, listen, I'm on my own. It's easy to make money, even though not for me, but for other people, it's easy to make money, but it's hard to write a book. And I am, uh, it's, it's admirable. And I am a, in awe of the fact that you've written three of them. I'm trying to write one. I'm hoping that I can reach out and get some tips from you about how to uh, approach the process. Well, good luck with that. And thank you both so much. It is an honor and a privilege to be on your show, truly. Thank, thank you. you. Please, thank you. Please, one request, tell your wife to listen to this episode and let us I know will. what she thinks. I'll make her okay. do well, it. Well, this lap episode, she will listen to that. It was no murder and it was a very peaceful episode. The book is Extreme Punishment. The author, Stephen Epstein. It is available anywhere books are sold. Amazon, Kindle. Love you, America. <laughs>